So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the fifth edition of the NAID Digital Roundtables, uh, which aim to discuss research conducted at the nucleus of Irish studies at UFSC with uh, scholars and artists from Ireland and from the Irish studies global community. Uh, the research we develop at MA, PhD, postdoctoral level and today we we'll welcome Ruth Barton, Lance Pettit, and Kathleen Hauser to discuss contemporary Irish film studies and reflect, among other reasons, on the, the Irish national cinema, film and TV studies, women in Irish film, interfaces of Brazilian and Irish film, border conflict and violence in Irish film. Uh, before introducing our guest, I would like to thank my colleague and coordinator of NEI, Maria Rita Drummond Viana, the co organizers of NEI Digital Roundtables, the tech students in the backstage, and especially Council General of Ireland, uh, Owen Bannis, who will open the event with a couple of words. So thanks for being with us again today, Owen. Thank you, Beatrice, and uh, thank you for inviting me once again to, to open this afternoon's roundtable on, uh, on what promises to be a, a very interesting and, and stimulating discussion uh, around contemporary Irish film studies. If I may, uh, just to offer a warm welcome to our guests, Ruth, Lance and Caitlin. Uh, thank you for joining us from uh, across the Atlantic. Uh, I, I'm, missing, I'm missing home myself. Uh, I'm really looking forward to, to listening and, and, and absolutely learning from you all on an area that, uh, that, that interests me. Uh, if I may also, just to everybody tuning in, to wish you a warm welcome. Uh, today in Sao Paulo, it feels like I'm back in Ireland. It's dark and it's cloudy <laughs> and it's a bit cold, but it's, it's wonderful to have you all with us. Uh, as, as I said, it, it's a real privilege, Beatrice, to be here this afternoon on behalf of the Irish Consul Consulate and also our colleagues from the Irish Embassy in Brasilia to acknowledge the, the extraordinary and uh, innovative contribution of Nucleo de Estudos Irlandeses to the promotion of Irish studies here in Brazil. Uh, you and your team, Beatrice and Florianopolis, are invaluable drivers of Irish studies here in Brazil. Uh, and today's event is yet another uh, wonderful demonstration of this. Uh, and all of us at the consulate and the embassy are most grateful for all that you do for Irish studies. We value uh, our rich friendship immensely uh, and look forward to the continued success of our strong partnership in the weeks and months ahead. And I know there are some interesting and exciting and thought provoking uh, events to come. So we look forward to those. When reflecting on the theme for today's round table, I was brought uh, on, on an extraordinary trip down memory lane. If truth be told, it made me uh, a little homesick as I reminisced on the many wonderful hours I spent in Irish cinemas, such as the Savoy, the Irish Film Institute, uh, and others, watching some of the most incredible uh, and impactful Irish films in, in, in recent film history. Uh, so many of us here in, our, in Ireland and across the world, including here in Brazil, uh, have been captivated, captivated by the comedy and humour of Irish films such as In Bruges, Intermission, The Guard, uh, and one of my favourites, The Snapper from the, the Barrytown trilogy. Uh, but it's not all about comedy. Irish films such as Hunger, The Wind That Shakes the Barley, The Magdalene Sisters, together with some outstanding documentaries, including on John Hume and Roger Casement, ensures that some of the most significant, and at times most difficult moments in Irish history are portrayed in the most delicate and powerful of ways. Uh, Ireland's magnificent writers have also been brought to the big screen with Emma Donoghue's novel Room, Colin Tobin's Brooklyn, and Sally Rooney's Normal People, just three of so many brilliant adaptations. Once, Sing Street, and of course, the commitments brought music alive in a way a live concert does with visually spectacular animations such as Song of the Sea and most recently, The Wolf Walkers, leaving us all spellbound. An incredible art form, uh, film brings us to other worlds, which at times can be tough, but at other times it can be just magical. Of course, what is seen on the screen is only a fraction of what goes on behind it, with the producer, director, writers, sound, place, casting, visual and props, just some of how behind the magic, uh, of how behind that magic results. Indeed, I tend to sit and watch the credits after films and continue to be amazed at the amount of people involved. I could go on uh, particularly, uh, but I think that we are left in no doubt that Irish film has and continues to make 
an, an incredible impact on both the national and international stage. In essence, film is an incredible art form and argu arguably one of the most influential sectors of modern society. However, how is society influencing film? How has Irish film been impacted and influenced by key aspects of our history and culture, including the varying interpretations of the conflict in Northern Ireland? Ireland's economic, economic boom and subsequent crash in the 2000s, uh, commonly known as the, the Celtic Tiger, the interaction of this uh, and Irish film with, Brazilian, with Brazil, and finally, the ch challenges presented by COVID-19, uh, which has seen streaming platforms such as Netflix, Amazon Prime, and others begin to dominate. It is this uh, in mind that I pass the floor to our esteemed guests. I, I truly look forward to hearing your uh, most valuable perspectives uh, and, and great experience of Irish film and its contribution to our society. Many thanks, Beatrice. Uh, thank you so much, Owen, for this uh, interesting kind of map of uh, Irish film and Irish film themes in Irish film, and also for pointing out to the collective nature of film production, which is sometimes forgotten. But uh, so it was interesting that you brought this uh, to the discussion. So uh, our first guest today, Professor Ruth Barton, is head of School of Creative Arts and associate professor in film at Trinity College. And she's also a member of the Royal Irish Academy. She has published widely on Irish cinema and her works include, and I have her books here, Irish National Cinema and uh, Acting Irish in Hollywood. She has also written critical biographies of the Hollywood star Hedy Lamarr, the most beautiful woman in film and the Irish silent era director Rex, Rex Ingram. Rex Ingram, visionary director of the silent screen. Her latest monograph, Irish Cinema in the 21st Century, was published in 2019 by Manchester University Press. Ruth was at UFSC in 2017 for the second forum of the Nucleus of Irish Studies of UFSC. And she contributed to the third volume of the series, Island in Film, Screenplay and Critical Contexts, edited by myself and Lance Pettit, with an article on Alan Gilson's The Road to God Knows Where. So this almost feels like a research group in terms of uh, the work we've done so far and the work we are doing and hopefully will continue doing. Great to see you again, Ruth. And I guess your book of 2004, Irish National Cinema, leads us to our first question. Is it possible now to speak of an Irish national cinema? Yeah, you know, this is, this is so hard, Beatrice, and I was interested, in fact, in Owen's uh, collect selection of films as um, sort of representing um, Ireland and Irishness, because, you know, I've, you might wonder about In Bruges, for instance, to what mm -hmm. extent, you know, it, it's a good example of a film that can sit on the sort of borderline of Irish, is it Irish? Um, and and mm -hmm. certainly, you know, in, in the time uh, since I wrote Irish National Cinema, even then I was saying, what is Irish National Cinema? Is it just, you know, what I say is Irish National Cinema is going to have to be it. But, but in, the, in the meantime, between writing that book and writing, you know, my most recent book, Irish Cinema in the 21st century, it's become even more difficult because, you know, long ago we used to just say, oh, well, the financing decided it. You know, if, if, if a film was financed in a certain country, that was the country of origin and that was fine. But now we have, um, uh, you know, co-production financing, which, which almost entirely dominates uh, filmmaking. So, you know, the sort of test cases are, you know, even more than in Bruges is the lobster, you know, <laughs> is the lobster an Irish film? Um, and, you know, we, we really celebrated the, the success of The Favourite. But I really doubt that many people who saw the favourite outside of Ireland, or even maybe the inside of Ireland, you know, thought of the favourite as an Irish film. And yet, it's produced by you know our most successful production company, um, Element Pictures. Um, so you know, it's it's a really hard one. Um, I think that it's important to hold on to the idea, though, and that's why I wrote one of the reasons I wrote the most recent book is to, just to kind of try to kind of claw back something of the many film productions that is Irish and speaks to a kind of sense of being Irish, perhaps from, 
you know, from inside rather than outside, because I actually haven't seen Wild Mountain Time, but I'm not racing to, to press play on that one. Um, but I rather imagine that, you know, this, you know, much laughed at and ridiculed film, probably, I wouldn't probably say most people would think of as Irish, others might. So, you know, I think that there are still things that we need to hold on to. And I think we need a national cinema. We need it to be funded uh, through the various funding schemes that we have, primarily the tax incentive scheme, but also from uh, Screen Ireland, which is very highly funded in the scheme of things. Um, and, and there's also a sort of small section funded by the Arts Council for very much art cinema. So, so I, I, I think that there is a, a national cinema, but it's really hard to decide what it is. But I think it is should be something that speaks to Irishness uh, and speaks to multiple ways of being Irish and speaks to multiple places of Irishness. Um, and that's what I was kind of, kind of trying to seek out with, within the more recent book was, was to kind of just question those ideas of identity and place primarily and, and how they relate to, to, to Irishness. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, so a, a, a second point that uh, we discussed while preparing this roundtable is if you can't talk or if it's difficult to talk about a national uh, Irish cinema industry. So how about TV studies? Yeah. So can well, you distinguish cinema <laughs> studies and TV studies? You, you know what, it's becoming more difficult again. I mean, I was recently asked to write an article on The Fool for, for an, a, an academic journal, and, and I found I could do it easily enough, even though it's a TV series. But, you know, we're, I did an interview um, with Lenny Abrahamson and, and, um, with, mm -hmm. uh, and with Ed from, from um, Element Pictures. And, you know, they have moved really far from where they started those two as Trinity students, you know, making small films together. Um, through all of Lenny's films, um, you know, and, and including Room, which is, you know, Irish, Irish, um, uh, to, to Making Normal People, which of course was the talking point of, of early lockdown um, and, and was extraordinarily successful. Um, and so I think that that, that gap is, is closing. But I mean, I would say that Normal People does not represent the output of Irish television. Um, it's, it's way ahead in terms of quality and in terms of its ambition. But there, is, there are huge opportunities coming up because um, there's really a debate going on now as to what extent the UK can pro provide English language television programming uh, to Europe now that it's no longer in, in the EU. And there's almost certainly Europe will cut down on the amount of television programming it allows to be imported from the UK. But the UK is the major provider of, of television programming, particularly platform programming in, in, in Europe. So Ireland has this amazing opportunity now to step into that void that that is being left by quality British television and 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 produce stuff and really really should be taking it so I think that you know in terms of criticism um, we have to be much more open because Irish television studies is is many 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 like there's so few people working in Irish television studies there's no even good books on Irish television studies I mean Lance's book that you wrote years ago Lance was half tv half film and there's really you know there's not much else there's a certain amount of stuff on tv as industry but very little on on tv as as, as um as cultural artifact yeah isn't this interesting because TV is so much a part of people's lives, but in terms of academic investigation, it's yeah, somehow... Course, uh, in Ireland, I mean, you have to now ask how many people actually switch on a television and watch it, right? Right. Um, and the younger generation doesn't. Um, and the younger generation, of course, you know, to, for problem. Thank you. Yes, new perspectives of an Irish TV series. I reviewed that. I saw it. But you know what? It's got really little... It's got really little... Um, um, uh, coverage um oh but, but um yeah i think that you know the kids are not watching tv right um so what's irish television going to do it's it's got to be much more transnational and it's got to export itself it's, it's got to think of that that market you know that that welsh television is, is is filling really really well with its thrillers and so on um so you know it's got to be i think it's got to be sharper and much more it's got to really think about where that audience is it, 
you can appeal to your Irish market just as Irish film is doing, but you can also export really well. And that's what Irish film, when it's most successful, really does. Um, but Irish TV is, hasn't really, um, hasn't nailed that yet. Yeah, so uh, both the success of Irish TV and Irish uh, cinema uh, have been associated mostly with uh, the well-known male uh, directors. And I wonder, and I also uh, was inspired by the publication of this book that Lance was mentioned, uh, mentioned while we were talking before being live, uh, Women in the Irish Film Industry, to both, uh, and both you and Lance contributed to this uh, book. So what would you say is the position of women filmmakers, of women in the filmmaking industry in Ireland today? Well, there's sort of two, you know, two parts actually to that because actually women have always fared better in television. Um, mm. Television has always been seen much more as a women's uh, medium. It's, it's consumed uh, in, in the domestic space and therefore it's always seen to be more a domestic medium, right? Um, so women have always, and, and also television privileges the writer rather than the, the director. And that's also, you know, women have been, because one of the big problems is that women have really struggled in the television industry to deal with the working hours. You know, it's, it, it's, it doesn't sit well with family life uh, and often, you know, they, they, they can't do it. Um, I mean, I, I you know, Susan Liddy's work has been fantastic and she's also a huge advocate for women in Irish film. Um, and, um, you know, she's been one of the people who's really, really been pressing for, for uh, more supports for, for women filmmakers. And this also comes on the back, not just of the Me Too movement, but the Waking the Feminists movement, which started with the Abbey Theatre and, 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 and with acting. Um, and, and, you know, on foot of pressure, the um, Screen Island has, has introduced supports for women filmmakers and, and more women are getting to make more films. But the real concern is that, um, what films are they getting to make? Um, that they tend to be getting the small relationship films um, and uh, they're not getting the big budget films because the funders still don't trust women uh, with big budgets. Um, they're getting to be producers, but they always were because producers organize life for other people, particularly men, <laughs> to make films. Um, and, um, and so there is still a really, really very big gap to be, you can't just do it on numbers, right? You can't just do it on who's, how many films are being made by women. You have to ask what films are being made by women. What, what are those films' budgets? Where are they being exhibited? Um, and, and there's still a really long way to go. I mean, you know, women get documentary, lots of documentaries, really good documentaries being made by women. Um, some of the good animation is coming from women. Um, but it really isn't, it's still a, 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 it's still a hard one for women to, um, to, to crack. I mean, we're moving in the right direction, but you know, we're certainly no better than anybody else. And I, I think, you know, probably in, in many ways worse. Yeah, I myself uh, have struggled to find material on Deirdre Friel. And she's made so many uh, TV films, adaptations of uh, Brian Frio and uh, of Mary Levin, important mm -hmm. uh, adaptations, but it's hard to find academic uh, material on her work. Yeah, and I mean, we, you know, we have Pat Murphy, obviously. Um, uh -huh. and, and, but, you know, Pat Murphy's really stopped making films quite a long time ago. Um, and, uh, you know, we... <laughs> Like, who, who do we have? Who's our new Pat Murphy? Well, you know, you, hmm. um, so there's nobody who's really been talked about in that way. And, and a few people are always being wheeled out to represent Irish women filmmakers. Um, so we, we just need, we need more of this. And it starts in education. It, you can't just expect the film industry to just, you know, find people. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, thank you very much, Ruth. Of course, we could uh, go on talking to you uh, forever and I hope uh, we will have another no chance uh, in I, person. I'm talking forever, I'm an academic so you know. Uh, just... No, no, but I could. <laughs> I'll press my own mute button and then I'm, I'm done. But I could. Uh, but anyway, I'll now pass the floor uh, to Re Maria Hirt and Lance who will continue the conversation. Thank you Beatriz and it's wonderful to be here to be presenting Lance. Lance Pettit with four T's is an associate research fellow at Birkbeck, University of London, 
and a secondary school teacher of English. His upcoming book is The Last Bohemian, Brian Desmond Hurst, Irish Film, British Cinema by Syracuse, 2021. Some of his essays have been translated into Portuguese well, by yeah. myself. <laughs> I am Lance's official translator and interpreter and now introducer. And that the, the one that I'm particularly proud of, Lance, it, it, there have been many, but this is the one I'm most proud of, is O Fantasma da Máquina, Yates e Filme como Médium. And that there I had a really hard one to translate. That was a tricky one. <laughs> it was. We've talked a lot about this because he yeah. is actually talking about media medium as singular of media, but also medium as in talking to ghosts. So that was that was a tricky one. And that came out in the book Vidas Irlandesas, O Cinema de Alan Gilsonen in Contexto, which is part of the Série Estudos Culturais, and that was volume five, edited by our own José Roberto Shea, and of course, Beatriz Kovchitz Bastos coming out in 2019. And I unfortunately, unlike Lance, I don't have all the books here because all my books are in Florianopolis. <laughs> all my workbooks are in Florianopolis and I'm, I'm speaking to you from my hometown of Belo Horizonte. And Lance is the co-editor again with Beatriz of Ireland on Film, Screenplays and Critical Contexts which started in 2011 and it's still an ongoing series putting out fantastic uh, books in bilingual format and with films attached. And this is the 10th year with the fourth volume in the series coming out. And we've already mentioned her today, Pat Murphy. Pat Murphy's Maeve of 1981 is the next volume, the upcoming volume. For 2021-22, he holds a Leverhulme British Academy Small Research Grant to explore the border fictions, a concept that we're discussing today, of Eugene McCabe in his novels, stories, and television. So thank you so much, Lance, for being here today, and it's great to see you. Thank you for having me here, and it's great to see you too. Lance has been with us in Brazil. He was just talking about that since 2011 or 2010, which is when yeah. he first came. So this really does feel like home talking to all of you. Lance, I have then a first question for you, which has to do with your latest project. So yep. your current research project is on the late Eugene McCabe, who died in 2020 last year, and who's perhaps better known as a novelist. So I would like to hear from you what your interest in him is and why his in, you're interested in him in Irish screens in, in Irish screen and perhaps tell us for those of us who don't know him as much a little bit more about him his work and the focus of what you mentioned as his border fictions and it it's interesting that that Ruth has already explored the the, nat, the matter of borderlands today yes uh, I, I noted uh, Ruth's use of, of, of uh border lines and borderlands. Um, both of those are obviously pertinent to uh, my work on McCabe. Um, the work on McCabe uh, is slightly problematic in that COVID intervened last year. Um, I the money that I got from the, the British Academy in Leverhulme was to travel to the archives uh, in, uh, in Dublin uh, and at RTE, the national broadcaster, uh, where his material is mostly held, but also he had um, his own personal paper archive um, in uh, just outside Clonus uh, in uh, in Monaghan on the border. And um, unfortunately, because of COVID, because of his illness, I wasn't able to um, access um, that part of his paper archive. Um, although I had, I did make one trip before COVID restrictions closed me down uh, last February. Um, so I'm hoping that this work um, is, is work that I can um, pick up um, later on this summer and on into the new year. Um, I've been given an extension for the, for the grant anyway. So just for those people that are, that are um, not familiar with McCabe who are um, looking in on, on this uh, conversation. So Eugene McCabe was born in 1930. He died last year, as you say. He was born in Scotland, but of, of Irish um, Catholic heritage. He moved back to... Uh, the border um, 
around Clonus, uh, Monaghan, um, Fermanagh border. Um, he uh, university educated and uh, became a kind of a strange combination of being somebody who was a farmer. He owned a farm and worked on a farm at the same time as he began writing fiction. Um, he did do a little bit of school teaching work, but essentially for most of his working life, he was a farmer and a writer. Um, he began writing um, short stories and then plays really in the late 50s and, and 60s. My, uh, and he's known as particularly now um, as a fiction writer. Um, he is, I would argue, at the edge of the Irish canon of, of, of Irish fiction writers. Um, that's another debate. Um, but I'm, I'm coming to him principally as a screenwriter because when I looked um, at his material, um, I realized he has, also has papers in the National Library uh, in Dublin. I realized in fact, how much that he had written for the small screen. So he'd written a lot of work uh, for RTE in the late 60s and all through the 70s and some of the 1980s. And my particular focus uh, in this small project, this one year project is on a TV trilogy. Um, it's, it's known as the Victims Trilogy. It's based on three short novellas um, that he published in 1973 through to 1976. So in historical terms, I'm going back to kind of contemporary, but uh, you know, 50 years ago, um, television history. Uh, and I'm picking up a kind of a methodological point that Ruth adverted to, you know, and, and um, Beatrice mentioned, you know, what is the difference between film and TV studies, um, the institutional, the economic and the political and the viewing uh, circumstances are all different. But in, when you're researching it, um, my, my uh, problem, I suppose my task is, is how do I access this material? So I'm actually, screen studies for me uh, remains, uh, in this particular project remains analog. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not about those issues of, of digitalization and convergence that we talk about in terms of contemporary television and contemporary film, which are all very important. Um, and I would agree with uh, earlier remarks that were made about, you know, actually television itself is now becoming, uh, for, for contemporary younger viewers, they don't watch it. They're watching stuff on their phones or tablets or other devices. Um, however, with me, it is still about paper and it is still about analog, <laughs> although that analog obviously has been digitalized. So I'm, I'm getting at it uh, through digitalized copy of this is the interesting thing of of celluloid film. So this stuff made in the 1960s for television. Was filmed on celluloid and I actually originally viewed this in the when I was doing my PhD, I originally viewed this on a Steenbeck viewer. So I, I have seen it uh, projected uh, on a small Steenbeck um, through the celluloid. That in itself tells us about the history of the medium of television in Ireland and particularly um, the use of film celluloid. Um, so the quality of image of, of this series in the mid seventies um, is really quite sharp and really quite, um, quite beautiful. Um, because it's filmed on location, uh, it's filmed on that border. So it's a very important uh, example of the way in which the, the, the Irish border, or some people call it, you know, the British border in Ireland, um, is uh, the way in which it's, it's imaged. Um, and reading around, there aren't that many representations of the border on screen, uh, the small screen, or indeed uh, in, in cinema. Um, and Surprisingly, when you start to read around it, um, not that many books which are set in or about the border itself. Um, you know, so it's uh, it's interesting for all that all that sort of reclamation job that I'm doing. Um, I'll say one final thing, and I'll let you get your second question in. The reason um, that I think this particular series is significant. Um, is because that it was made and uh, broadcast in the middle of a period of, of um, heavy political violence in Ireland, particularly in Northern Ireland, relating to the Troubles. Um, at that time, RTE uh, and indeed the other British broadcasters um, 
had quite a quite a strict sense of censorship uh, on the Irish uh, the Irish media uh, in in terms of um, presenting political violence or proponents of political violence. For example, uh, Republican uh, speakers on on news or current affairs programs. So what's important, I think, about this series is that we have over three hours of broadcast television, which presents the lives of people living through um, and being involved in that political violence, uh, both from actually a, a Protestant and Ulster Protestant UDR background, uh, U, U, UVF background, I beg your pardon, and um, as well as um, Republican violence. So it was quite an interesting thing that RTE produced this for drama, whereas it was actually censoring its own news and current affairs output. So I think for those reasons, it's historically important. There we are. That's quite a long answer. Sorry about that. No, but that was that was a fantastic answer. Thank you for that. And uh, th this isn't something, this is just my being very curious. Apart from going to the archive and getting the digitized copies, how accessible would the series be to people who, who might be interested in, in seeing? Well, that's a very, uh, very pertinent question. Um, you can see short clips of it uh, on RTE's uh, website. If you go to their archives, RTE archive section, you can see um, there is some material that there, but they're very short clips, short and, clips. and some still images. Um, as ever with, with scholarship uh, and publication, uh, we run into difficulties of uh, copyright release and, and so Absolutely. on and so forth. Um, so it is not easy uh, for people in Ireland to see this. You, you have to physically go to the archive to watch it. Um, I don't know whether, you know, whether or not in our own series, uh, you know, Ireland on film, whether or not we could actually produce that. That is certainly something that uh, Beatrice and I have discussed in the past. Um, I have access to the scripts now. Um, I can see the scripts. Um, and I'm interested obviously in the way in which the scripts move from the short stories um, into the final uh, film version. The other thing I think that's interesting is, and um, you mentioned her already, uh, Beatrice, uh, and we were talking about women uh, in Irish film and Irish television. Uh, Deirdre Friel uh, was the director of this trilogy of three films. Uh, she was one of only two uh, drama directors, I think, working in RTE in the early mid 70s. Um, I would very much like to um, get in contact with anybody that worked with Deirdre Freel, or if we know if there are any papers um, by Deirdre Freel. Um, there is there is there is virtually nothing on file in the in the paper archive at RTE, um, but she clearly um, directed and produced uh, several other. Um, TV uh, productions uh, in that period. And I think I've got some letters of exchange between her and Michael Garvey and Eugene uh, McCabe talking about the series and how, it would, how, the, how the trilogy would develop. Um, so there, there's a ton of material there, um, I'm sure. It's just a question of locating it. Finding it, exactly. Yeah, and accessing Thank you, Lance. it. Yeah, absolutely. So let's hope your upcoming book does somewhat feel a little bit of the gap, even though you were only talking about one author, but it will illuminate all the matters to do with British T with Irish TV. So this is fantastic. So you've already mentioned it. And of course, we're going to address the series that you co-founded with Beatriz, Ireland and Film, Screenplays and Critical Context. And I'd like to highlight the presence of the screenplays, which I find is quite a it's quite a differential. It's, it, it's the big difference that I find in this series. So pioneering so many aspects, but having access to the screenplays, as you mentioned, is something that we don't often get unless you go to the archive. So that was founded uh, uh, over a decade ago, as we've said, and we've already had four volumes. I would like you to explain the title a bit and also the rationale for having it as a bilingual series. Mm -hmm. And if you think its aims and the format remain relevant to contemporary screen studies and its methods. Yeah. OK, so uh, lots of lots of uh, heavy thinking over the last year or so uh, in lockdown about this series and the fact that we were coming up to, to, to 10 years 
Um, I think the original idea, um, if funny enough, it came out of a Mostra that we'd had in Brazil. So we were showing uh, John T. Davis's films, you'll remember it, and here's the book. So it was, it was the book of the Mostra, um, I suppose, was the how it sort of came about. Um, but underlying that was the idea of, of the, the idea that to make available and accessible screenplays and moving image versions of uh, films that were not um, necessarily commercially or well known. Um, so, and, and we had a kind of a scholarly and educational uh, use. We wanted to make materials that instructors, as they would say in the US, instructors could use in the lecture room or in the classroom. And also, as you mentioned, this was always going to be a bilingual um, project because we wanted to take Irish uh, film and, uh, and, and screen studies beyond the Anglophone world, which, which clearly, you know, it, it had its place. Um, so it was partly about a kind of uh, historical reclamation task. Um, it was trying to work at the margins of production. It was trying to um, highlight um, creative individuals and collaborative teams um, at the edges of the canon. Um, and also, finally, the last point to make, I suppose, was um, we we began to realise as we as we work through various volumes and, and try to choose um, various volumes, we realised that the, the even the notion of the screenplay itself, the concept of a, what is a screenplay, um, you know, it has a deep and complex history. Uh, we found that, um, you know, the first uh, the first film that we did, The Uncle Jack, or Tio Jack, um, didn't actually have a screenplay in the strict sense of a screenplay. Um, so that was a kind of a, a kind of reconstruction, a rewriting job. Um, so uh, none of the books that we've done, uh, they've all had different sorts of screenplays. Um, so that in itself, I think um, some reviewers of, of the book series have picked up on that and it saying that that's something that we should focus more and do more kind of theoretical work on the notion of the screenplay. And I, and I think particularly uh, in relation to, to remarks that, you know, Ruth made about television and we've been talking about, you know, screen cultures, you know, beyond film and TV, um, that itself raises a lot of questions about how new writers and directors um, create that material with, with different, different sorts of screens and different sorts of viewers in mind. Um, so all of that, I think, has, you know, after 10 years has sort of come out of, of being, being involved um, intellectually with this book series. Absolutely. That and the matter also of the media, how you presented the films, that's also something that has evolved as it would in 10 years. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, as I said, we, we, we started off from um, projecting and presenting films with a live audience in an auditorium. Um, of course, now, um, in the last 18 months, uh, you know, my work with the Irish Film London, um, a, a, an annual film festival, uh, which runs other events during the year that had to go completely online uh, last March, and um, so now we have to contend with the idea of you know what you know what is exhibition it, at this point post COVID. What is exhibition of film? Uh, what, what what constitutes that um, experience, and what constitutes that relationship between between the film that's created um, and the audience that that are viewing it. Um, those, those are very big questions, um, but they obviously impact upon uh, Irish producers, uh, writers uh, and, and actors um, who, 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 who are performing in these films, you know, in different, in different types of, of production. You know, we, we've seen, haven't we, we've seen uh, productions where two actors are on different screens sharing a screen you know, reducing almost in a kind of Beckettian way uh, to that kind of minimalism, you know, of, of actors performing, but not being able to be close or touch each other. Um, so I think all of those, all of those issues, I think, are raised uh, by, by the, the times that we're in.
Absolutely. I would very much like to talk about your thoughts on post-COVID, but I'm slightly concerned about the time and we want to hear from Kathleen as well. So maybe if I have time, some other time. Thank you, Lance. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And Beatrice, back to you for Kathleen's introduction. Thank you very much, uh, Heath and Lance. Uh, it's wonderful uh, to reunite, reunite this group of uh, researchers and friends and to see how much we've worked on together so far. This is really great. And talking about working together, uh, let me introduce uh, Kathleen Mara Rosa, who is a postdoctoral researcher, research fellow at the Department of Film Studies at Trinity College Dublin, carrying out a research funded by the Irish Research Council on urban conflicts in the cinema of Northern Ireland and Brazil under the supervision of Professor Ruth Barton. She holds a doctoral degree from Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina from the postgraduate program in English and was a visiting researcher at St. Andrews University. Her research emphasis is on war cinema and the analysis of embodied violence and its possible meanings in cinematic representations. Kathleen, it's great to talk to you uh, on screen. We yeah. miss you so much in Florianopolis. <laughs> we are all so pleased to see you uh, carry on your wonderful research with Ruth mm -hmm. at TCD. Mm -hmm. So Thank could you. you tell us what you are, wor you are working on in your postdoctoral research? Absolutely. So first of all, thank you, Beatrice, for the invitation. It's lovely to be here with everyone. So yeah, uh, right now, my research deals with films that take place during uh, the late 20th century uh, in Northern Ireland and Brazil. So I'm trying to bridge these two countries here and always focusing on the representation of the body. This is really my area of study since uh, my master's. So I analyze very specific images of embodied violence. So the moments of the hurt body in, in this particular research in urban environments of street clashes. So when the police or the military and they clash with the civilians or um, a group of people um, and also confined spaces of prison. I'll be working with prison films as well. Uh, in order to understand uh, constructions of national identity, I'm going to be working with issues of uh, abuse of power, oppression, dominance. And uh, for the Northern Irish chapters, because I think I think of my research in chapters because it will eventually become a book, hopefully. Um, so for the Northern Irish uh, chapters, I focus on the troubles. So movies that take place during the 80s or the 90s in Northern Ireland. And um, so far I've chosen to work with Bloody Sunday, a classic, um, and a, a more recent film called 71. And for the prison films, I'll be working with Silent Grace by Maeve Murphy and another movie called uh, Maze. So in these films, I'll focus on, on to what extent the hurt body can convey ideologies of sacrifice, which is a theme that's much current in Irish studies, or damage in the middle of these political confrontations. And for the Brazilian part of my research, I'll be working with the environment of favelas, the slums, right, uh, in movies that take place in the 80s and the 90s. So I've chosen so far Tropa de Elite, Elite Squad, and a very, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very new film called A Divisão. It's a 2020 film, actually, The Division. And for the prison films, I'll be working with the wonderfully crafted Carandiru and uh, in a movie that's not very well known called Almost Two Brothers, Quasi Dois Irmãos. And in this one, the, uh, I'll be focusing on how this violated body can be a site of a hopeless sort of circular violence in the middle of this socioeconomic turmoil of Brazil. And um, uh, besides working with national identity issues, I'll be working with, um, you know, the themes of poverty, of terrorism, of criminality, themes that in a way um, make the cinema build a sort of national imaginary based on the context of each one of these countries. 
Yeah, and uh, so you're working with uh, Northern Ireland, yes. not exactly the Republic of Ireland, mm -hmm. and Brazil. And why is that uh, choice? Oh, okay. So that's a good question because the choice of these two territories is basically based on how these both contexts, they are partitioned cities in a way. They're segregated mm -hmm. cities. So they're separated on... In, each, each, context, each context has its uh, characteristics, but they're uh, partitioned, they're separated by these political wars, these economic wars, religious, territorial wars. And, uh, and this is where the hurt body, and especially what I focus on mostly, which is the sensorial depiction of violence in the characters in, in the films, how they similarly produce meanings in, in, in these very oppressive environments. And in, although these clashes, they happen in, in urban landscapes or prison spaces of each country separately, they, in a way, they, they transcend these geographical uh, limitations. And they, they most certainly convey this fierce struggle for uh, power and for territorial dominance and in that sense, they similarly display a, a heritage of conquest in the histories of both Northern Ireland and Brazil. Yeah, thank you, yep. Kathleen. And uh, given it's, if it's academic work, mm -hmm. could you tell us a little bit about your theoretical framework? In Absolutely, the research? yeah, that's a good one. Uh, because I'm... I'll, I work a lot with how the senses, the four senses mm -hmm. are depicted cinematically. Um, and um, for that, I'll be working with authors such as um, uh, Yifu Tuan, Chinese author, and Paul Rodaway. And they, they really touch on how senses and geography are united. So my focus is both on the landscape of the cities, the landscape of the prisons, and the sensorial immersion of the characters in them. But in particular, for the Northern Irish chapter, I have a yeah. very special author. Uh, she's called um, Sarah Cole. And I was introduced to, his, the, to this author by uh, my PhD advisor, Professor Robert Burgoyne. And when he uh, showed me her work, I just fell in love with it. And she's very um, um, focused on British and Irish histories and literature. So her book, um, gives a lot of examples from these um, uh, parts. And uh, she brings the concept of enchanted and disenchanted violence. Mm -hmm. so here you have, uh, Beatrice knows about this because I've, I've been talking so much about this. So enchanted violence uh, basically um, uh, avoids the image of the hurt body, of the violated body. And particularly in the Irish context, it focuses on the positive metaphors of glorification, of sacrifice. And uh, um, a disenchanted type of violence would be a, an opposite direction almost. It relies on the images of corporeal destruction, showing the graphic, highlighting the, this grotesque side of the physical violation. So, I choose very specific scenes from the films, from these films that I, I, I told you about. And I, I apply these notions to understand to what extent these representations of, of corporeal destruction of the graphic images of, of the body being violated, uh, how, to what extent they rely on the transformative power of violence, a sort of glorification or the lack of, of these glorifying principles of the hurt body. So um, that's for the Northern Irish uh, part and for Brazil, for the Brazilian films, because the Brazilian films, they um, uh, both uh, Tropa de Leite and A Divisão, they, they have a lot of scenes of torture. So they deal a lot with the pain of the characters. So I chose uh, one of the main authors for this part will be Elaine Scarry. And she deals a lot with the representation or the possibility of representation of pain and uh, the process of torture, the, the construction of, of torture as a, uh, as a way to deconstruct language and deconstruct the tortured person's world 
and especially to create a fiction of power. So the, the torture process creates this fiction, this possibility that another person has power over this tortured person and, uh, and, and making a spectacle out of pain, using objects to highlight the process of inflicting pain. So that would be more uh, related to the Brazilian chapters. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Kathleen. We are all looking forward uh, to your book now. Yep. And uh, I suppose it will uh, be a great success. And oh, uh, we, we still have a couple of, of um, minutes for questions from the audience who is uh, attending and following the conversation in uh, the webinar in YouTube. Uh, it usually takes like a couple of minutes for people to uh, warm up and uh, be brave for the first question. But uh, yeah, let's give people a minute to write the questions down. Yeah, they uh, they will. I'm keeping and, uh, an eye out. So they're t they're typing them in to the chat box. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Harissa, who is uh, in the backstage, yeah. <laughs> will send us the, the questions. But as it usually takes a couple of minutes. Oh, we've got one already. Yeah. So a question to Kathleen. You mentioned uh, the film Bloody Sunday. So in your opinion, is there a character in the film that exemplifies the sensorial emphasis in your analysis? Mm, okay, so asked yes. by yeah, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Uh, oh yeah, uh, we were actually talking about this film uh, this week. Uh, um, so the short answer is yes, but uh, if I have to explain that, I would say that. Um, um, well, Bloody Sunday deals with um, that episode, that historical episode when the British soldiers shot those you know, civilians in Derry and uh, during this protest march um, that was against uh, internment without trial. So the, the film um, has the main character is Ivan Cooper, who's mm -hmm. played by James Nesbitt. And, um, and in my analysis, in my opinion, I think he's a conduit to this sensorial, to this embodiment, to this embodied perception of violence uh, in the film. Because if you watch the film and then you see in the beginning how he is uh, a part of the community. In the beginning, he's getting ready for the protest. He's just walking around the streets, he's shaking hands, he's inviting people to go to the protest. He's just, you know, one of the guys, very- Constant Politician. Yes, absolutely. So he's immersed in that environment. He knows the, the city, he knows the, the alleyways, he, you know, he, he's there full on and people listen to him. As the situation gets more tense um, and the march starts, parts of, of, of the march start, uh, they start detaching from the main, uh, um, um, yes, it's, it's the Paul Greengrass film. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and parts of the people from the march start detaching from the, the path that they had planned to um, confront the, mili the British military in the barricades that are set up uh, around town, you can see that his voice sort of subsides and his power of persuasion goes with it. And the film shows that we can't hear him we can't just, uh, uh, his voice is, is just gone, um, both in terms of audio and in terms of persuasion. So, and, and as, as the violence escalates, that's even more, more, that's even clearer. But Ivan has a very particular uh, characteristic that I like. He's very tactile. He's a very, um, he's, a, he's a character that touches a lot of the other characters, especially the ones that are deceased or the families of the deceased. So you can see how his touch is very compassionate and how his character exudes this idea of loss, this idea of disenchantment. So I would say for sure, Ivan, yep. And there's a matter of the casting as well, which- Yeah. Yeah, well, you, 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 you told a lot about that. You told us a lot about that, Lance, especially with the 
five minutes to heaven as well when you showed us both. Yeah, yeah. Now that's really interesting um, what you've mentioned there about uh, shifting my thoughts now to, to those senses and the way in which those are depicted uh, in a way for, for a viewer to, to witness or to, to identify with. Um, it's not something I'd thought about before. So that's a kind of an interesting um, thing to, to, to draw your focus on. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because as you, Lance and Ruth, have analyzed this film in your books, <laughs> uh, it, um, I, I've seen a lot of different angles on Bloody Sunday, but this angle in particular, I, I think it's, it's, it hasn't been discussed. And I thought it was an interesting way to look at how um, these extreme moments of violence can affect the narrative and can affect the way the viewer understands the narrative. Can, can I maybe ask Ruth a question? Is that of okay, course. Beth? Yeah. Yep. Ruth, I was just wondering what you were saying before about how broadcast TV isn't watched as often by younger people. But I, I, I'm thinking about your work on genre TV and particularly how genre gets uh, foregrounded in streaming platforms. Can you maybe talk a little bit about horror films in Irish cinema? Yeah, in fact, I think the last time I was with you, that's what I was talking about. Um, yeah, that's so, brilliant. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, there is just such a kind of mini industry of making um, horror films that are, you know, really very global in, in terms of of um, their reach. And of course, they do hit a very particular audience segment as well. They tend to be that younger group that everybody's chasing because they're also the group advertisers uh, want as well. Um, so yeah, um, they, they keep coming out. And, but what I do find very interesting is, I don't know if he's listening, but I have a, a PhD student who's looking at the depiction of the priest in Irish cinema. And that, that is a theme that keeps coming up in the horror film over and over again, is that somehow um, there is this sort of connection between Irishness and Catholicism that is, um, you know, comes through in so many films as we know but comes through as a sort of aspect of horror um, uh, in, in these, in these um, films. Uh, and it's a sort of, it's like almost a global selling point of Irish cinema that we recognize this. And it has to be recognizable, to, as you say, to go on a streaming platform, it can't be too difficult. It, uh, it has to have those sort of genre, um, those, those genre notes that you're hitting. Uh, and so one of the ways that these Irish films make themselves both Irish and global is to place the Irish Catholic Church in it, but to make it um, uh, the sort of scene of much of the horror it comes through the, the priest. And of course, you know, we've all seen The Exorcist, <laughs> most of us have. Uh, and so we know there's a tradition there. Uh, so I think it's a very neat way of being kind of identifiably Irish and making your mark, but also being very much reaching the global audience. And of course, that younger audience who probably are, you know, ever more inclined to view the priest if they even recognize one, if they see him um, as, a, as a figure of horror. So, yeah, I mean, that, that, that whole thing is, is really interesting, that, um, that, horror, that horror market. And that's why I was interested in writing about it. But I haven't even kept up to date. Like there's so many of them. <laughs> <It's kept laughs> up. Yeah, the priest and the nun as well. I was thinking about St. Maud. That was, that was, a, well, that's not, is, it, is that Irish? I don't even know if that's, that's not, okay. No, but you know, once you get into like, you know, this, once you start watching stuff with religious characters in it, they usually somebody's Irish at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> that's <they're> usually brutal. <laughs> well, uh, I guess we are now uh, about to finish our hour yeah. and this conversation. Would you like to say something, Lance? I'm sorry. No, I'm just saying, yes, actually, it's uh, 1851. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much, all of you, Ruth, Lance, Kathleen, Maria Rita, and uh, Owen, for being here this afternoon. And I do hope that we will be able to carry on with this conversation very soon in person again. We've, you have all visited us in Florianopolis, and it would be wonderful to repeat that uh, as soon as possible. 
Meanwhile, we are looking forward to Kathleen's book and uh, to our next uh, volume of uh, Screenplays in Critical Context, Lance Maeve, which hopefully will come out uh, this year. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, Fantastic. thanks for inviting us, Beatrice. It was lovely to see everybody, if only virtually. Indeed. Thank you, thank you very much yeah. for the invitation and the platform. It was uh, a very, very uh, enjoyable hour. I hope I hope people listening on YouTube enjoyed it as well. Yes, thank and you. It, it will be available in YouTube and you can see all comments there, if you like, and people attending. Great. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.